Welcome to Stories and Songs, a series of interviews featuring inspirational musicians from the world of jazz and improvisation. I'm Andrea Keller and I'm thrilled to be talking to Nadia Nordhaus today. Welcome, Nadia. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, absolute pleasure. Um, so let's get into the questions. The first question, what have been the pivotal events in your musical journey? Okay. There's, there's quite a few. <laughs> um, so I thought I would just sort of talk about the ones that were um, probably the most unexpected because mm -hmm. um, I started um, playing trumpet and piano when I was really young and I never, I never thought I would be a trumpet player. That was never the plan. Um, and so I played in school bands and then I quit for years. And then so when I was... Um, when I finished high school, I actually went to school for sound engineering and multimedia and music industry studies. I had like zero plans of being a musician. That wasn't, I wanted to be sort of more behind the scenes. Um, so I, I moved up to Lismore to Southern Cross University. And um, the, the pivotal moment really was this sort of, a, it was sort of this seemingly um, small thing where I'd, I'd been there for six months and I still had no friends. <laughs> and, and I saw this ad uh, that said um, trumpet player wanted for um, a vocal recital because they had a contemporary, well, they still do have a contemporary music program there. Um, and so I thought, well, it's a really good way of meeting people, I think. So I got my, I didn't have my trumpet with me. And so I got my trumpet sent up. And um, yeah, so I, I met some people and then I played on the recital and then it just sort of exploded from there. I ended up playing in a funk band and, and just, just met so many awesome people. And it, yeah, so it just sort of like changed, yeah, it changed my life in, in that little um, uh, period of time. And then I, when I moved back to Sydney, I thought, well, that was that was that like now I'm going to go back to what I thought I was doing and I was working. Um, um, but I, I wasn't playing at all. And then I, I was distributing radio commercials. That was my job. That was my sort of <laughs> just trying to get into the industry and just failing miserably. Like I just could not um, get it together. And so um, I ended up getting fired from that job. Uh, for for being a woman, <laughs> which is which was incredibly frustrating, obviously at the time, and I was really angry about it. Um, you know, you would think that they would have noticed when they hired me, but anyway. <laughs> um, but I was just like, you know what? Like, if there's no security in anything, why don't I just go play music? So that was the other pivotal moment that I thought of. So there was a sort of like just seeing the ad and just going, well, you know what, I'll, I'll go meet some people not thinking that it would actually be um, so important in sort of steering me in this other direction. Um, yeah. And then also getting fired was pivotal. <laughs> Otherwise I'd still, well, hopefully I still wouldn't be um, distributing radio commercials, but I would be working in a studio or something, you know, or doing live sound or something. Um, so yeah, so I, I moved to Melbourne like a month later. I was like, I'm going to go to VCA. This was like 10 months before the audition. <laughs> I was just very, obviously very confident, but I just, or does, it wasn't confident. I was just sort of clueless, but, but that was a good thing because I didn't have time to talk myself out of it. So I moved to Melbourne a month later and then I just spent the next 10 months just preparing for the interview so, um, and the audition. So I just had... Um, I had two jazz albums and I just like, like it's kind of blue and um, uh, it's not take five time out Dave Brubeck. So I just played along with them and miraculously got in. Um, so getting into VCA definitely was a pivotal moment. Um, and then the last pivotal moment, <laughs> I wouldn't have mentioned there's quite a, sort of quite, quite a few. Um, but it was when I was in between uh, finishing um, my undergrad at VCA and then uh, I uh, was doing my honours year. And I was just so tired of being in school at that point that I just really wanted to get away. And my sister just 
um, it's like when you when you used to call to make travel arrangements. She called a travel agent to see if there was a flight to New York, and then she came back and she said, "I booked us both on a flight to New York, and we leave in two days." <laughs> so it was just like amazing last minute um, trip. It was January two thousand and two because um, the flights were very cheap at that time, um, and so I just yeah went on a vacation to New York and had this crazy. Um, sort of very serendipitous like meeting of people um and then it, it, it the the last bits of a long story but the last the last portion after I'd had I bumped into Monique Di Martina yeah. who I'd only met once and weirdly she had she had I, I'd written her an email but I hadn't heard back and I went to this gig at the Blue Note and I heard Nadia and I'm just like that's bananas because I only know one person and 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 she had she had written me an email but she'd written it to the wrong address but in the email she said come down to this gig tonight and I was there so it was like this weird some some voodoo's gone on um but anyway I had a session with her and then I sat in on her gig and then I sat in on the drummer's gig and then on the drummer's gig I met someone that said um you should you should go do your masters at Manhattan School of Music and I laughed I said that's very funny like I have no no money and he's like go speak to the dean and so I I I went the next day I was leaving that day um to go back to Melbourne but um I walked into Manhattan School of Music and just got this feeling I was like oh no <laughs> I'm going to go here and I have no idea how I'm going to make that happen. So it was like this 18 month crazy process of just like, yeah, it, it was of applying for grants and getting grants to go study in Amsterdam and, and meeting the Dean and, and it was just this completely bananas thing that it, it could have, it could have fallen apart so many times and it almost did. Like I was at one point I was ripping up my financial aid application and my roommate at the time just said, why don't you email them? I was like, Oh, okay, I'll do that. Like just so many times it just ne you know, never happened. So nearly didn't happen. So that was sort of the last pivotal moment that sort of put me on the track that I've been on probably for the last 17 years that I've lived in New York. So yeah. It sounds a fabulous journey. <laughs> it's, it's been bananas, absolutely. It's a bit bonkers, really. Yeah. You got there. You I got there. there you know? Yeah, I'm still, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about obstacles that you've had to overcome. Uh, obstacles. Well, um, I guess, well, firstly, my family is really awesome I'm very lucky so I think whatever obstacles that I had I was very lucky in the fact that I always had my the support of my family so even though you know they hated jazz it doesn't it didn't you know it's still my dad still is like do people pay money to hear that you know <laughs> so, but but having said that they are actually very supportive and they you know they they gave me some grants you know to <laughs> to travel and do what I want so um so yeah so my family have, have been awesome and uh, giving me sort of like just sort of like an emotional safety net you know um for for the obstacles but the obstacles I, I thought of was when I had started my undergrad at VCA I I didn't know anything <laughs> Or I felt like I didn't know anything. I couldn't read chords. I could. I couldn't transpose. I knew two jazz albums. Like I was so far. I didn't know who anyone was. I just. I just felt completely, utterly clueless. So that was an absolute sort of challenge, I guess, that I had to. I felt get over really quickly. Um, and so I remember uh, speaking to Rob Burke, who was teaching at VCA at the time, and he said, "Transcribe every day." So that's what I did. Like I went to the library, I transcribed. It took me an hour to, to do like Miles Davis. I think he played like three notes and I'm just like, oh. <laughs> Luckily I got faster at it, but I just, I, I just worked really hard and, and it, was, it was really, really challenging and I, I cried a lot <laughs> in my car. <laughs> but but um, 
it, you know, to me, when I look back, it's sort of amazing to me and quite bizarre that I went from sort of knowing two albums to then in four years time enrolling in masters at Manhattan School of Music. Like it's a little, it's a little, it's a little weird. Um, and so to all your hard work and everything you put in and. Oh, thank you. I just, I mean, I, I, I think it's about sort of, well, for me, it was just about following my nose and just being really sort of stubborn and, <laughs> you know, about it and just, just, yeah, being a bulldog about it, you know, even though I was sort of, you know, secretly crying in my car. <laughs> um, but when I started the masters, the, the program was so different and it was so based in the language of bebop, which I, that wasn't really my thing. I was more of a sort of, you know, European jazz vibe. Um, and I just found it just incredibly challenging. And so again, I felt like I was starting at zero and just perpetually running behind the bus. Um, so that was uh, very difficult. Also, I had no money and I ran out of money the second year. So, <laughs> so I lived, I lived in this pretty awful apartment that had lots of cockroaches and I had no money for food and I ate oatmeal like every morning for breakfast and then a friend of mine would buy me lunch at school which was very kind and then I used to work at the school because that was the only work that I could sort of legally do on my visa and so I worked as a an usher and a house manager for for the concerts and so then afterwards they would have the receptions for you know and I would just eat the reception food so that was dinner <laughs> so it was just like this awful year of just well two years really but it was that was a really challenging time and and at the end of it I'm like I don't think I want to do this anymore like I just I'm sick of being so poor <laughs> so so I sort of quit again and I just I I worked at the school um but in the distance learning department and I was just scheduling and just sort of doing administration work um, and then that didn't work out. So I'm like, well, I may as well go back to playing. <laughs> it's like I've tried, I've tried so hard to do other things. Um, but I found it was really hard for me to get work. No one hired me at all. Like, um, and part of that I would say definitely was because I was a woman. It was just sort of just, they just don't think or don't just don't would just never occur to people that have they've got their group of mates and I just wasn't part of it so um, the only gigs that I did were with all women bands for years like I want to say three or four years all I did were like all women that like call them club club date bands I forget yeah and and an all-female big band and that was it and then no small ensembles it was just like why did I move here and gave up this lovely life in Melbourne to like you know like play somebody's wedding you know um, so that was really challenging and it wasn't until I got a call to play a rehearsal for Darcy James Argue whose big band I'm I'm in but he was very he's very aware <laughs> and um and very inclusive and so I realized that this rehearsal I mean it was just a rehearsal but for, for me it was like this massive deal I'm like this could lead if I if I'm seen playing in this band that will lead to other things and that's exactly what happened so it just took a really long time it took way longer than it should um but it just took a really long time to sort of get established or get gigs or for, for people to hire me. So those, those are some obstacles <laughs> that I've dealt with along the way. <laughs> You've got to have resilience, don't you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You've got to be a bulldog. Yeah. Mm. And, and what advice, do you have any more advice? I mean, you've already shared some, but what advice would you <laughs> like to give to younger musicians? Um, I would say be on time. Um, that's really important and by being on time that means early like if you're there if the rehearsal starts at 10 and you arrive at 10 you're late <laughs> um, and I think yeah as, especially here in New York you've got a line of people waiting to take a gig so if you're seen as remotely unreliable then you're then you're out so um, I would definitely just say um, yeah be on time um, and also just allow yourself to sort of 
think about these impossible things. Like I think if I had, if I had not allowed myself to do that, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't have um, had all these lovely opportunities that I've had. So just, you know, just like think of these crazy things and then almost work backwards. So it's like, this is the, the crazy goal that seems very unachievable. What are all the steps that I would need in order to get there? And there's your to-do list. <laughs> Fabulous advice. Yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, and finally, would you nominate a song or an album that, that you've created that's particularly significant or important for you and tell us just a little bit about it? Sure. Um, the, the tune that I picked is called Mayfair and it's from my first album. Um, and I, I picked it just um, because I guess I, I like it. <laughs> Um, and I think this, I mean, the reason why I did this album was because I wanted a green card and in order to get a green card, I needed an album and press and all that, that type of stuff. And so I think when I was actually recording it, it, it had felt like such a process to actually get to the point of recording that when we were recording and I was playing with all these incredible musicians and playing my tunes and being in this really amazing studio, it was just sort of like this really wonderful moment for me. So um, yeah, so that's my tune. <laughs> thank you, Nadia. We look forward to listening to that. And thank you so much for your time today and for sharing all your wisdom and insight and, and just fabulous um, ideas with us. Really appreciate it. You're that. most welcome. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Nadia.